Thanks for having me here this evening. Uh, thank you all to, for joining as well. Uh, you know, it's a million, I was going to say a million distractions that one might do uh, after work hours, but I guess these days there's not an awful lot of distractions going on. Can't go out uh, much. I don't know, maybe you can in your countries where you're from, but certainly where I'm in the UK, we're still heavily locked down. Um, so I thought we'd have a little bit of fun um, this evening. Uh, mix uh, fun with work for, for a change and uh, so I've got my uh, I've got a, um, a mural board which uh, is like a whiteboard uh, electronic whiteboard probably by now most of you would have uh, seen a mural board so I'm going to share in the chat um, a link to the mural board and then uh, in a bit we're going to do a little uh, uh, exercise a couple of exercises uh, on it so I'm just going to share that now in um, in the chat so feel free to click on that link and uh, see if you can get in there. You won't see a lot at the moment, but uh, we're going to sort of unfold it throughout this uh, sort of uh, time we've got together. So um, tonight, as Barry said, the talk is going to be on the future of Agile. So when you log into that board, you'll see my crystal balls at the top. Uh, of course, no one really knows what the future is, um, but we're going to try and figure it out together what the future of Agile might be. And then at the end, I'll give uh, a bit about a, a little bit about my opinion about where, where I uh, see things going. Um, I, I happen to be in a fairly privileged uh, position of like Barry, uh, running a fairly large community and also um, working with quite a few clients, uh, not as many as perhaps before COVID, certainly um, a number of clients and seeing what's going on in organisations as well as in the community. So I kind of share some of that uh, experience of where I I think where I think this industry of, of agile and change is going. So um, one thing I would like to encourage, uh, if you uh, it's optional, obviously, but uh, it would I would love you to turn videos on um, because it's really good to see you and uh, see each other. And uh, so if you do fancy, if you're not you know kind of sitting there naked uh, with a glass of wine or something, do feel free to put your video on, and uh, it makes it a bit more um, a bit more community based where we can see each other's faces. That'd be fantastic. So um, if you could go to that link, um, and we're going to do uh, a breakout room straight away because I'd like to get your uh, the, the state of things as they are now, uh, and then we'll progress from there. So, um, is there, uh, so I'm going to ask a sort of general question. Do please shout up now if you're not or unable to get into that mural room or you don't know what I'm talking about or you're struggling with the tech. Um, is there anyone who can't actually get into that mural space and see this um, see this board and I assume you can if you don't speak up good okay fantastic brilliant so we're going to do an exercise for 10 minutes we're going to go into breakout rooms there'll be about four three four five of you in a breakout room and what I would like you to discuss and then in this um, hopefully there's at least one person in your group who knows how to use uh, mural um, you're going to create stickers and i'd like you to leave those stickers as yellow they'd probably be yellow when you first create them um, and what i'm going to ask you to do is i'm going to ask you to have a discussion and write stickers uh, and if you could keep them at a reasonable size because there's quite a few of us using that little space so if we make massive ones it's going to take up the whole area so if you can keep them fairly small and what i'm going to ask you to discuss and put in there is the current state of organizations now. So this, if you remember, this talk is about the future of agility. So what's the current state of agility right now? So what are you seeing out there? Now, I don't want you to focus on the actions of what people are doing. I want you to focus on organizations. What's, what's the current state of organizations? Now, I'll give you an example. An example is something like um, our leaders are completely um, in the change themselves. That's a state. It could be that um, it could be like finance is operating iteratively and have, has a budget which can be drawn down as we change our direction. Or it could be finance is yearly budgets and we have to tell every we have to figure out exactly what's happening right now, but for the next year, and then we have to stick to it and we're measured against it. So there's lots and lots of things that you could choose to talk about in terms of organizations right now. We're going to have 10 minutes to discuss the state. Now, for each thing that you put down, the state, I'd like you to think about what past actions or mindset led to that. 
So two parts. What's the current state and what previous or past actions led to that? So I'm not interested about what actions people are doing now in terms of agility. What's the state of organizations and the past actions that led to them or the past mindset? Thank you for doing that exercise. What I thought was is that uh, looking at the um, the stickers on there, it feels like we probably need about another five minutes. Um, and what I was thinking was is if we could use this five minutes to focus purely on the blue stickers this time and have a look at the mindset beliefs um, that uh, that may have led to this mindset or the actions. Now I'm just going to share my screen quickly. So. Um, some of you may have um, come across the mindset beliefs, um, which um, I defined pretty much years ago, and it's become a, uh, it's become a sort of uh, uh, a fairly good tool as a, a diagnostic tool to kind of figure out where or what why are things the way they are. And typically, um, the mindset is uh, you can pretty much trace back what's happening in an organisation to people who have influence in that organisation and what their mindset was at the time that they made these uh, decisions. And so um, there's the three beliefs I'd like you to think about. Is complexity belief. Do we believe in complexity? Do we think things are um, uh, um, predictable from the outset? Or is there a level of unpredictability? The people belief, this is about putting people before tools and processes. Agile Manifesto is very much a people belief document. Do we believe in people? Do we trust people? And proactive belief is about continual improvement. Are we continually assessing how well we're doing, both within ourselves, our teams, our products, our departments, our organization, our relationships with our customers? Are we continually improving? So do we have these beliefs? Um, and so when we look at the, um, so this is the uh, mural board we've just been playing with, have a look at the ones that you've created in yellow and have a think about what kind of mindset or actions led to this thing in yellow. What preceded this? What kind of actions or mindset? And that's the blue stickers. So we're going to go back into... Um, we're going to go back into the breakout rooms, but this time just for five minutes and just fill out those those uh, mindsets, which kind of what kind of mindset led to this phenomena that we're seeing. Does that make sense? Welcome back. So um, for those who have just joined or June th joined throughout that exercise, what we've been doing is uh, mapping the current state of organizations. So what are we seeing right now and past actions or mindset that has led to the current state? And um, what I'd do is encourage anyone to turn their video on who hasn't got it on. It is optional, but uh, if you would like to turn your video on, it's always nice to see people's faces um, so we can all see each other. So if we just have a look at that, uh, if we take a step back or a kind of a view back and have a look at that, what kind of insights are we seeing right now? What kind of insights have you been talking about? Would, you, would anyone like to share one or two things from the exercise? I can share something. So we talked about a number of different types of companies. We talked about very large banks or organizations that are heavily regulated where the regulation and outsourcing and, uh, and control structures essentially prevent agility to the largest extent possible. Everything is a project. Nobody owns the product. So you don't have a small autonomous team that is able to do that. You look at the opposite of that, which is Amazon, which has a fantastic infrastructure, but also has this concept of a single threaded leader where you do one thing with one small team and the team has the autonomy and authority to do what needs done and doesn't need approvals from the rest of the company. Versus in the bank, you want to deploy something, you open a port in a firewall, it's a 16 committee process. So it's a very, very different mentality, very different structures of the companies. Um, and so you have both of that. And then we talked about smaller startups that are very focused on one product and think about the customer first, the product first. And so the focus and this fast turnarounds on those are very agile. Brilliant. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you for sharing that. Would anybody else like to share anything? Any yeah. I can share. I can share um, Team Four's uh, feedback. So um, both Aid and GG's uh, feedback were quite similar in terms of the fact that both of their companies are growing and they're going on the agile journey. 
Um, and in, in both cases, you tend to find the IT departments lead agile and all other departments trail behind. It does, in my mind, uh, reminds me of the fact that the business should be included in that journey because, um, you know, businesses need, have, have, have requirements and often just throw them over the wall and ask, ask dev teams to, to, to follow through on that. Um, so I think uh, Gigi said 50, she's kind of 50-50 agile. They're moving towards agile. Um, and um, Aid also did, did say that when he joined the company, they'd already decided to embark on the agile journey, but it is still the IT department doing it. Um, I've come from a different perspective. I've just left a, a large organization that's now enterprise and um, they have actually become a bit anti-agile in the fact that when you become very big, um, they try to solve problems with, with the growth of a large company. They have many departments that are siloed, that are not communicating well, that have always done things differently, and they're trying to standardize and harmonize the organization. And then they in introduce a lot of painful processes and um, things that do tend to feel anti-agile in some ways. So you have to have to fill in lots of approvals to get stuff done, just to, just to make sure that everybody's falling in line with uh, with what, what everybody's supposed to be doing. Yeah, thank you for that, Andrew. That's really interesting. Um, thank you. Um, and if we all have a look at the mural board now um, and look at what we've just take uh, sort of 30, 40 seconds, have a read through some of these stickers that other teams have written and um, see if you can get a sort of sense, sort of feeling about what's going on for us as a group, as a, as a, as a large team, if you like, because we're all working on this project of figuring out what the future of Agile is. That's our um, problem. What, what is it that we're seeing here? What, what's the general, general overview? Could you, I'm not entirely sure how to answer that question because I'm not entirely sure what you meant by the question. Are you saying what are the key triggers and what are the key reasons why we're having problems? Like what, what are the, the kind of root causes? Is that what you were after? I wasn't quite yeah. sure. Yeah, thank you for, for asking for clarification. That's brilliant. Um, any kind of patterns, I guess, that you might see in here? Uh, root causes is fine. Uh, I'm kind of seeing root causes as the blue stickers being the causes for the yellow stickers, whatever that might be, positive or negative. So I was wondering if there was any patterns in what we're seeing. There might not be, um, but if there's any kind of sense that we might make out of what we've put here. So I, I, think, I'd, I think I'd think about some of the resilience engineering um, uh, practices that all the you know, things that are coming into our consciousness now so for example there is no root cause right because it's not one thing it's a multitude of things and it's a socio-technical problem right so it, it, it you know we have there's a myriad of problems right so there's the the kind of culture where the business says you know this is what we want it it's your problem just go and solve it for me and they're not willing you know they're not sort of getting involved and maybe that's not easy actually to get involved anyway because their organizational structure doesn't isn't aligned for flow. It's aligned around capabilities, which means you're just going to build monoliths and you're going to throw things over the fence at each other. Um, you know, we're, we're trying to solve the pro complex problems from one location. It, you know, it, sorry, everybody's trying to solve complex problems, but they're all playing different games. So by that, what I mean is, you know, your let's say your operations team, for example, their game, they score points in their game through resilience, through, uh, you know, uptime, uh, all these sort of things. Whereas in development, they'll score points in their game through features and, um, you know, change. So you've got one that wants stability and one which wants change. So, and then they're both trying to solve speed to market as a problem. So, you know, trying to solve it from a silo, you're not, you, you know, you're not, it's, it, you're not going to get the right answer. So what we end up with is what we're sort of seeing here is things like, you know, we've got water scrub type situations where we've got one part of the business that's using agile, like your development generally, because that's how they've decided they're going to solve speed to market. But the rest of the chain <laughs> that the delivers software from the business right the way through to, to operating and, and, and running it are not, uh, you know, uh, 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 not using agile necessarily. So, because uh, they're because yeah. the the way they score points in their game is different. So they're trying they're trying to solve it through a different means. So I, th I think you know that I could go on, but I, I won't. <laughs> but but the the point is, is there's like loads of different there's loads of different causes and loads of different problems and, and, and things that, that that are at play here. Um, and so I don't think there is a root cause per se. I think there's you know you could point to many of them. Yeah, I think, I think Simon, Simon uh, from some of the people I spoke to, I think like people were expressing that they were like, uh, get, like they got to their current state by 
being forced to almost do do stuff by the book. You know, re- really like you know, follow the, the the processes that they've been you know, that, that, that they've been you know really like told. This is how you do agility, but not really thinking about the context. And I think you know that's where like where people have got to now, where they're looking at like you know how to how to be agile across the enterprise and, and what that means in their context. And I think that you know up to this point they've got got there by being forced. To, to you know, forced to be agile, you know, but and, and kind of like almost like in a very command and control way, without really consulting you know the workforce as to what really that means for them. Yeah, thank you, Barry. Thank you, Chris, as well. So, um, so what we yeah, so so what, what I'm hearing when I'm pulling out from what people are saying is we've got silos, we've got people being forced, we've got kind of this level of trying to create consistency across um, the, the approach. Some someone's putting the thing uh, top down agile. I just saw pop up. Um, we've got um, uh, so we've got this kind of trying to to, to make this a sort of consistent process uh, and looking through some of the things here was um, uh, humans are difficult to quantify and measure very true um, zero trust lots of silos so silo is a huge challenge for um, any kind of flow um, so it, seeing that fear of the unknown. Uh, it's creating things like complex legacy risk adverse regulation. Um, so, 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 so we've got this kind of um, various different things. And as Chris rightly said, it's a, it's a complex problem. So there's lots of factors interrelating like a complex web. So um, I'm also seeing the same things. I'm seeing the, the same silos, the same kind of mentality, the same kind of fear led approach or kind of directive command and control approach. Um, that kind of centralized uh, sort of push to to make the organization agile which is pretty much the opposite of people over process so that's kind of what we're seeing now and we know what's kind of led to that so we're going on a journey here so we've got to the current state and we've looked at a bit about the history of where we how we've got to this what kind of mindset led to that i would now now like us to do another exercise um, and uh, this will be the last one for a while and then we'll we'll do something different Um, and we're going to have a look at the next um uh, part of the mural and we're going to unblock this and this is the current actions now so i'd like us to go into breakout rooms again for 10 minutes and i'd like us to discuss now what are the current actions so what we've seen is we've seen the current state and we've seen past actions that led to that so what are the current actions let me just lock that it's just uh, moving Let's go. there we go so um, what we want to look at now is the current actions. What are we doing in our organizations now? What actions are we doing now? Does that make sense? So we looked at past actions and current state, and now we want to look at the current actions. So any insights from the current actions, anything that you would like to share or anything that you can look at on this board and see any patterns again, anything like that, any insights that anyone would like to share um, I noticed a few post-its around this idea of running transformations or running transformation programs. I see it definitely uh, it must have been discussed in a few <laughs> uh, rooms. So there is definitely that pattern, which maybe links to some of the things that we had in the previous quadrant around kind of um, short-term thinking or the culture of instant gratification, or it's all about, t- you know, put it in a box get it done within two years. God knows what will happen on the third year. Everything is about short term, kind of the finite game over the infinite game. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Uh, anyone else have any insights to what we've been doing? So we've done pretty successfully in a very, very large bank arm's length innovation. So we were put as a speedboat very far outside of corporate governance as far as we could be while still being part of the group. Um, where we cut ourselves off as much as possible from corporate governance and all their systems that worked really well so we could build things in a modern way. Um, we're now we're also working with a big group, of course, and there we see people struggling with this whole concept of Agile because you have 16 different silos and, yes, you have maybe have in a digital accelerator a team that wants to do Agile, but because they can't because for everything they need approvals from the rest of the organization. And that is really, really difficult to make work. And so you're more doing agile theater as in stage play than actual agile development. 
because your yeah. because your organizational structures are completely against you. Thank you, Thomas. It is frustrating for sure. Um, anyone else have any insight? We've got time for one more. I'll, I'll share something if I may, Simon. Um, so I'm, I'm seeing kind of two thick two trends in, in a single organization, which is um, a large technology organization takes a and okay, well, we, 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 we kind of did that agile thing for development. So now we just need to take that and we need to rinse and repeat that. And we're going to roll it out across the rest of technology. And the way we're going to measure that is just by the number of people of some certification training. And, and that's a nice vanity proxy metric, which, which is kind of almost one of the actions that was on the previous uh, uh, session about how we got to where we are. But in uh, contrast to that, and rather refreshingly so, we've seen an approach from the business side, which is saying, okay, we need to have a kind of clear alignment to strategy. So do people understand what the business strategy is? Are we all working towards that? And how are we breaking things down across all of the functional teams that support the business and support the customer? And really a pull from the business rather than a push from technology. And I think you know, all of us here would recognize which one's going to be more successful. The roll out something to 23,000 people and say, yes, we're done in three years, capital A, capital T, or actually let's break things down. Let's make sure we understand why we're here, what the purpose is, are we aligned to that and it get the people working together on the best outcome? And so that's, but it, it does feel like, you know, within one organization, there's, there's two very different approaches. And I think the business one is, you know, being the business and that's where it's driving the revenue and the decision making. That I think will be the one that, that pushes through. But there'll be some, there'll be some organizational flux and some politics that will need to happen for that to be successful. Yes. So, um, so again, we hear about silos and we hear about, uh, in both of those uh, last examples, we you know there were about silos and how that is such a challenge to getting flow and value to the customer quickly, which is, um, you know, one of the, the key things of agility is being able to get that feedback in a complex environment. We want to be able to get feedback quickly so that we can adapt and change. And when we have silos, obviously, that impedes flow. There's lots of handoff, delay, engagement of teams, all those kind of things, which means that we don't get that feedback quickly, which means we can't adapt and we get left behind. We're not innovating, we're not growing. So one of the key things about organizational change is removing those silos. Um, my, uh, I'm writing a book at the moment if it, um, and the latest chapter is actually released yesterday. Or was it today? Yesterday or today, I've forgotten that. Um, but that was all about how to create teams from siloed organizations. So if anyone want, is interested in that, um, my uh, book, I think there might even be a link in here to that. So, uh, let's, um, so let's have a quick look then together at the current actions, uh, just to sum up what we've seen here. So the current actions, what's going on right now. And uh, again, we've seen um, uh, things we've talked about in the comments, Agile Theatre, Arms Length Innovation, um, Agile Onboarding Sessions for New Employees, which is good. Um, in text registering. It's good to see some good things. It's nice because I'm sure there's lots of good stuff going on as well somewhere. <laughs> Top-down change rather than building movement. People thinking that increasing the number of agile teams will increase organizational agility, but it doesn't. So we're seeing a lot of uh, a, a sort of dysfunction here in our current actions here. So let's, uh, I'm going to share my screen again and uh, we're going to have a look at, uh, I'm going to sort of share what I, I've also been seeing right now. Um, so I've just opened up another place on on this board and I'll share my screen. So somewhere there is a little thing that I can say, um, don't show any of the cursors. So I'm just going to take those off so we can see. And, uh, and then I'm just going to remove some of these uh, post-it notes um, so that we can have a look. Um, so this is kind of what I'm seeing now. And uh, I'll take you through this. Um, the the, the the key thing which I'm seeing as being the biggest challenge to uh, organizations is whether or not leadership, as in the most senior leaders in the organization, and have the right mindset for an organizational agility approach. So I've seen many organizations try to create agility from the bottom up. I myself have tried that over the years. And there's been all sorts of things like agility by stealth, um, sort of, I've even and have one organization come to us, offer us to pay a large amount of money to install a job, but don't tell the senior leaders until we've got it installed. Um, and uh, we turn that job down. Um, now, the, the problem is with this is that if you think about what leaders do, organize, you know, some of you may be these leaders. So if you are a leader, what you're doing has some kind of impact on the organization, one hopes. And so the way that leaders behave and the way that leaders show up 
affects everything. And so if we're trying to make an organ or trying to create organizational agility, it makes it stands to reason that if we want the organization to do something different, then leaders need to do something different. They can't keep doing the same thing and expect the organization to be different. It doesn't make any sense. And so this is the first check that I do when I'm looking to say, well, do we want to work with the company? Do we want to work with, are we actually going to be able to succeed here? I don't want to take on a job that I'm going to fail at. Can we succeed? So the first thing is, as we ask is, is leadership involved? And that's not in a sort of involved in the sense they've delegated responsibility. It's our leadership actually involved in looking at themselves and seeing how, what their beliefs are about work, about relationships, about the market, and about the iterative nature of complexity um, and, um, and whether things are predictable. So if that's no, then we've got this lovely picture here of a train wreck because that's what it's going to be. Um, so let me zoom in up here. This is like a train that's totally gone through here and off the rails. I'm glad we don't live in the times when this sort of thing happens too, too often. Um, but uh, unfortunately, in organisational development, it does seem that this is happening a fair amount. Um, so if leadership are involved, do they actually have the beliefs? Are they actually believing in the things which allow Agile to work? So the mindset beliefs here, as we said, with complexity, people believe in improvement. So if no, then we're going to get a process over people approach. So um, sure that's there for, um, process over people approach. Process over people means get a big framework, install it. It means make everybody do the same thing. It means don't change the silos, keep the status quo and make people work harder. Focus on tasks, not on outcomes. All these things happen because we haven't, we've missed the first step, which is about creating a leadership team that understand agility. And so what I'm seeing mostly in, 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 uh, in if you actually look at the stats in five different um, data studies, so um, this isn't just one um, study, but in five different studies, it shows that about 70 to 80% of agile transformations fail to deliver what the in original intention was. And that's still now in 2021, we're seeing 80% of transformations fail. And when we look at the reasons why they think those transformations fail, it's lack of appropriate leadership, lack of mindset, too many silos in the organization. These are the three top re re uh, reasons from the Business Agility Institute. So when we look at this, if we carry on doing the same things, we're going to get the same results. So what happens if leadership are involved? They are believing in the mindset. Then we have a chance. And what I can see from when we've done, if you look at the leadership circle, which does studies around how many leaders can deal with complexity and whether they're reactive or proactive in face of complexity, we see that actually only about 5% of our current leaders across our companies are actually able to comprehend what it actually takes to run a company in significant complexity, which is a very low number. 5% of leaders are able to actually cope with it. So we're actually not seeing much good agile, really, much companies being able to adapt to agility. So this is what I'm seeing now. And in those 5%, sometimes we're lucky enough to work with companies like this. And what we're seeing is people are starting with why. They're starting with purpose. They're starting with the reason why they're in business in the first place. And they're optimizing around the customer and they are creating the real teams, breaking out those silos, and they're doing it in a way which is inclusive, people first. They're using things like systemic coaching or facilitation techniques to allow people to collaborate together. Um, and, and that's what's happening. And it actually becomes a hell of a lot easier when you've got a leadership team on board. So I don't even bother starting with anything to do teams or silos or anything until we have a leadership team that gets it because that's what's going to be the biggest impact on any transformation. So that's what I'm seeing right now. So I'd like to um, uh, share this little headline with you. It's a Zen saying. Let me just uh, close that. So to see your past, look at your current state. To see the future, look at your current actions. So it's always about bringing in about what's going on now. So if we look back at these exercises that we've done, we can kind of see the future. 
this 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 talk this presentation or workshop whatever um i need to lock some of these elements so we don't accidentally move them around just do that there we go so if we want to see the future we can look at the current actions and if we look at this and we see things like include leadership, we're including leadership now, we are breaking down the silos and creating good teams, then we know that we're going to have a good future. If we see the same things here as we're seeing here, we're going to have the same stuff in the future as we are now. So this is kind of the, um, so, so if we want to use our crystal ball, we don't need to look into the future, we can see what we're doing now. So that's kind of what I'm seeing now. I'm seeing that 5% of organizations are able to move uh, and what is, um, uh, what's happening right now is, is mostly that we're not including leadership. So the next question is, is then, so let's have a think about what can we do? How can we increase this leadership engagement? How can we move towards a sort of a better place that we can increase this 5% and decrease that 70 or 80% of, um, uh, of failure. So we've got to be able to change something in, in the way that we're engaging now. So I'd like to share with you what I hope to see in organizations. Uh, and then what we'll do is we'll do a, a, well, before we move on, actually, is there any questions or anything, any insights or anything anyone would like to share uh, before we move on to the next bit of, of what we've what we've seen, what I've said here? Is there any, any reactions to that? Yeah, I think I'd say I completely agree with what you and completely mirror what you've just said. Uh, the key thing around uh, leadership, understanding their role within the change is is absolutely critical. So any any organization that either thinks that they can get someone to take the problem away from them or they get dazzled by, I, I don't know, a, a system integrator who comes in and says, yeah, give us 10 million and we'll transform you. Um that they're not going to get the result they want. So, um, uh, you know, that, that's that's something that we completely see um, ourselves. And when you do get them on board, the, the the key is for that leadership team to understand, and this is quite a shift for them a lot, a lot of the time, is that they don't have to have all the answers. And so they don't have to be directing it all. They just, they need to set the intent. And if they're happy to set the intent, this is where we want to get to, and they're open enough to taking ideas from from everybody about how to get there. Then, then that that's the big shift. If we see that, then then those are the companies that we see succeed and become high performers. Thanks, Chris. The, the really um, the key thing that came up with me of what you just said is about this uh, what we what I've been calling the expert mindset. And uh, many times, if you think about where our education. Um, we, we grew up in uh, pretty much probably everybody here grew up in, in in the school in a school system somewhere in the world where you were supposed to pass exams and you did it on your own. And if you collaborated, it was called cheating. And then when we went th after we got through that, we had to fill out something called a resume or a CV. And it told a story about how good we are. And then we went into a job role, which has a label on it. And you're supposed to be really good at that job. And I've heard many comments like you're only as good as your last project and all these kind of things. So we're expected to be experts. And yet we come into this world of complexity, a world of agile, where we're now expected to collaborate, where we haven't got all the answers, where it's not possible for us to have all the answers. So we now have to be able to create um, the right um, environment so that people feel courageous enough to speak up so that we can collectively get information from people and collectively sense make and emerge the right solutions together. That's completely the opposite of what we've been taught. That's the opposite of what we were told that we would need to succeed. So no wonder it's so hard, especially with um, leadership who have been relatively successful when the level of complexity and market change was lower. And now those things don't work anymore. And we've got to let go of the expert mindset and move much more to a strategic mindset or a transformational mindset, which helps us work with others. And that's that's a hard thing for people to, to do. It's a lot of inner work that has to happen for us to be able to let go of that. And a lot of cultural things that have to happen. Any other um, insights or um, things about the things that we've talked about? Um, Simon, I wanted to ask, what you mean by real teams you know creating real teams you know what is a real team 
Brilliant. Um, so a real team is a phrase that uh, I've coined um, because there are many different versions of what teams are, and it's really a reaction to the, um, the silo team. And a real team is able to work with a customer, produce value for that customer, and get feedback to adapt without dependencies from another team or very little dependencies from any other team. So it's like a cross-functional team. Okay. And that team can be 80 people, 150 people, but it's, it's a real team in the sense that they, they can deliver something of value. Gotcha. So they've got a common purpose and they've got the skills and tools to, to be able to get them. Perfect. Exactly. Simon, Simon, do you also think it's to do with like attitude within the team? I, 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 they, they are, they, 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 they've got each other's back, for want of a better term, and, and they pull together, you know, and, and, and they, they're, they're actually, you know, they're, there's some empathy and understanding as a group. Absolutely. And uh, this is a really uh, amazing phenomenon that just um, that, that struck me that we, we talk about sub optimization, where people try to make their team the best it can be, but actually destabilizes the whole flow. For example, if you think about a flow of teams passing work from one to the other, if somebody gets really, really efficient, then either they're waiting around or they're producing more work for the next team. And you can actually destabilize an entire system by one team being more proficient than another um, and it, it struck me that um, so that people don't like to de-optimize no one wants to de-optimize their team because of a larger flow and i realized that um, people optimize to the level of their identity so where you feel you belong to is where you optimize to but if you belong to a silo team you'll optimize that team if you feel that you are part of the product development team, which is everybody required, you will optimize to that. And so the real team actually has a shift in identity. People who belong to that team have a shift in identity. Instead of I'm a JavaScript programmer or I belong to the search team, I belong to the product team. And then we optimize around product team because there's one thing that product developers are good at is solving problems. So if we give them the right scope to solve the problems on, all these flow issues and team and structure issues will be solved, but it's an identity issue. And, and, and a real team gives us that scope to have that different identity. Uh, and it doesn't mean to say that you have to throw away an old identity. It's about yeah. adding to. So Simon, uh, just a quick question. How does this, um, you know, the real team, as you're coining it, how does that differ from, you know, you know, aligning around a value stream, aligning your project or your product team around a value stream. And, you know, is, is what Kota was talks about in his, you know, you know, dual operating, you know, uh, system, where he says, don't, you know, strike down the silos. They're good at what they do. They're good at efficiencies, et cetera. Create, you know, your, your product team going from concept to product around a value stream. Uh, is that sort of similar concept or is it? Is it yes. So a value stream is a tool for, in my mind, is a tool for creating a real team. So okay. if you create a value stream map, you'll see the bottlenecks in there. You'll yes. see the gateways, the checks, and all those kind of things. And you'll see where the flow of work starts to erode or where you're losing value. And at that point, you can start joining teams together and creating a real team. And if you actually take a value stream map to its absolute conclusion, you get rid of all the cues. Yes. And you end up with a single piece team, what they call in, in, in lean manufacturing, a single piece team yes. where you have a big team with lots of teams that are all cross-functional being able to produce anything from your backlog in yes. an ideal world. Cool. So okay, brilliant. So let's move on to uh, the next part. Um, and um, what I'll do is I'll, I'll share my screen again because I'd like to just show you um, what I hope to see. Um, and uh, where we're going from there. And, uh, and then we can have a, a chat about that as well. And then we can do questions and answers and things and see where we go. Okay, so sharing screen. Uh, so hopefully you can see that. And then I just need to make these visible. There we go. So these are the things which I'm hoping to see in the future as step, stepping stones to this approach. So we had a look at the past actions. We had a look at the present. We don't know what the future actions are going to be, but this is what I hope that they will be. And then let's have a discussion around these and see whether you're seeing some of these actions or not. 
Um, so I've just labelled them one to eight. These were the eight things that Barry talked about um, it, as part of the um, uh, description. Um, the first thing is working on as well as in. So if you think about a big organisation, people are in the system when they're producing value or enabling others to produce value. People who work on the system take a step back, like a coach, and says, hmm, what's going on here? I wonder where I could be of use to improve this system. And I see that, yes, this has started, but often the first things that go in budget cuts, as we've seen in COVID times, are the people working on the system. And there's been a huge amount of uh, unemployment, shall I say, uh, in our coaching industry. Massive amounts of agile coaches uh, let go over this last year. And uh, the very people who could be most use in adapting an organisation are the first to go. Utterly ridiculous, you know, but I totally get the stress and the strain. As a business owner myself, when cash is tight, you need to keep delivering the value. You need to get that cash through the door, especially if you're in a business which was hit hard by COVID that, you know, some businesses thrived, others didn't. Um, so I totally get that pressure. I totally understand where that's coming from. But to cut the people working on the business leaves you at the mercy of fate or luck. And we need people to work on the business. Um, so let's have a look at who those people are and what they do. So at the moment, I'm seeing a lot of centralised, if you're lucky, we're seeing a centralised uh, coaching function, which has a budget from ideally reporting into someone in the board level or very senior senior level, which means that because you've got a centralised budget, it means that you can dot around in the organisation, you're not trapped by the hierarchy. If you're trapped in the hierarchy, it's very difficult to break silo because you're literally employed at a certain level. And then if somebody is outside of your branch of the hierarchy, it's very difficult to go and coach and, and expect teams to merge together when it's not under your remit. Very difficult to um, change, make organisational change that way. So having um, so in this uh, organisational structure here, having a centralised coaching group is very important first step where budget is actually... Um, allocated to that group as a function um, and then moving on from that is actually coaching a strategy so having a, a strategy in your organization of growing coaching as a capability in all managers and this is what this moves to down here where we have a distributed coaching capability so that anybody who's a leader or a manager and i think of all managers as playing the role of leader now that they have some kind of coaching skills. And I'm seeing this in some organizations as part of HR training. It's getting rolled out in small bits here and there, but other organizations don't get it, don't understand the word coach, et cetera. So this is what I'm hoping happens. We start to see a centralized function that eventually goes into every manager has coaching skills. Any comments or anything or any insights or anyone else got anything to share that they've seen in this sort of space? As well, my company certainly let go a lot of its um, agile coaches. So, yes, I can see that trend happening. Yeah. Does anybody have an organization or, or is in an organization where there is um, a general move to teach managers coaching skills? So, we, do you we mean are actually... coaching, Simon, or do you mean coaching of a more general type? Um, I mean, coaching of a more general type, people coaching, like professional coaching, things like um, powerful questions or the ability to listen and grow somebody, that sort of thing. I would say I'm, uh, I'm, I'm at Nationwide and we, we do a lot of that. We've done quite a lot of work recently with even things where we created um, uh, things on the internet. We call it culture hacks to get stuff done for managers. And it was things like, how do you, you know, so it's a what what does good feedback like how you know describe a feedback process and things like that so uh, mm -hmm. creating safe spaces for people to speak up and things like that. you know speak up's not like a whistleblower's hotline speak up is about you know what you know at what point in teams do people have the ability to share ideas and, and things like that so uh, yeah I feel quite fortunate in that respect then yeah I would say we're starting to see some of those things good thank you um, so uh, to, to summarise what I think you were saying, Elizabeth, um, uh, so sorry um, that, that the technologies failed there. Um, so what you were saying was is that um, there was a, um, a, an approach 
for bringing coaching into management. There was a couple of meetings, either a, a couple or a couple every month for a while, but then it stopped and, uh, and there's been no further development on that. Is that, th that's what you were saying? Brilliant, thank, thank, you, for, uh, thank you for sharing that. Um, I'm sorry that the technology cut you off there. Um, so um, yes, so there was an effort there. Um, sometimes um, also as part of the sort of complexity, I think someone else put in the, uh, the, the stickers there, the finite game versus the infinite game. And uh, they're, they're very two different things. And if we think about winning, then we're probably playing the finite game. And uh, often when we, if we think about learning, is learning a finite game or an infinite game? And uh, probably it's an infinite game. We're never going to learn everything. We're never going to get to a point where we know everything. Um, but do we know enough? And uh, often with coaching, it's one of those things that we want to get to the place where we know enough. Um, but that typically takes years. Um, and so having a sort of coaching as a strategy um, is something we definitely encourage. Uh, and I'm glad that you've had some uh, so some. Uh, coaching in your organization elizabeth and uh, i hope that um that the benefits of that people start asking more and, and maybe getting some more sessions set up uh, so i wish you wish you luck with that um anything else got time for one more and then we'll move on to the next bit okay um, so um, I'll, the, I, I've worked in about three different organisations that have brought coaching in as a, a, as a strategy, and they've got uh, various communities of practice set up around coaching, and they set up groups where people can practice. Uh, and I love the thing Andy was saying about feedback. Uh, feedback's incredibly hard to give. There was a survey that came out recently with um, uh, thousands and thousands of respondents, and it was who gives feedback, who is happy giving feedback, who is happy giving positive feedback and who is okay giving negative feedback and it came out that about two percent of managers give any type of feedback whatsoever two percent of managers give feedback which is just crazy um how do we grow if we don't get feedback uh, and then there was something like um it was something like about three percent of those managers were happy giving negative feedback so i don't know what two percent or three percent of two percent is but not very much so we're obviously very challenged at giving and receiving feedback in our cultures. Um, and I think that that's something that would be good to kind of bring in. Okay, let's move on. So the next thing is um, leadership skills, um, bigger investment into leadership programs. I did see that in one of the stickers that there's a leadership programs going on. I'm certainly seeing the demand at AWA for our leadership program uh, increasing. Uh, so we've got a leadership program, which is like a nine month cohort program. And we take leaders through that and grow them. Um, and so that they grow their relationships and things like that. And I'm hoping to see more of those types of programs and organizations where people are able to really make that shift. And I've put this thing here, shift from the I to the we. And uh, what I mean by that is that um, we are by nature, our, our um, cultures, our societal cultures are very independent based we're very much in, we love our independence and um, no one wants to give that away, but we're also interdependent, meaning that we rely on each other. We all rely on each other for our success. Now there's no, no, none of us live in mountain cabins and grow our own vegetables and, and are isolated from the grid. You know, maybe there's a few people like that, but we can't survive like that in society. We have to work together to solve the challenges that we face in society. And those are very similar to the challenges that we face in product development. So we've got to work together. And if we're going to do that, we need to shift from the I agenda and add on to it the we agenda. How do we do the things that are going to benefit all of us as well as the things that are just going to benefit me? Uh, and there's a whole science to that. Um, so that's what I hope to see. I hope to see leaders going on more courses, uh, more uh, uh, self-development so that they can deal with complexity and this kind of uh, what I call the people tech, the inner skills. Um, leaders change their behaviours. Everyone is included. Uh, so, Barry, you were talking about this um, in, in terms of this uh, approach where people push change into organisations. You know, we've seen the installing of the frameworks. We've seen basically it doesn't work. I know that there's still a lot of people going through that, a lot of people still using the big frameworks. Um, and, uh, you know, for those of us who have been on the cutting edge of this for some time, we've seen enough now to know that. That, that, that it doesn't give you the results that you want. Um, but as I was saying, just on the breakout room there, it feels like everybody has to learn it for themselves. 
Um, so, um, uh, you know, I do feel for everybody there. But if we can create something where everybody is included in the change and the change emerges out of the current state, then we're going to have a lot more success. Um, I'll go through these last three uh, fairly quickly, and then we'll have a uh, we'll have another uh, a chat and a discussion. Um, so stakeholder and value-driven change, not framework-driven change. We've talked a bit about that. We want to be optimizing our organizations around, around our business, around our business success, not around agility. Who cares about agile? If you talk to the top CEO people, do you care about agile? Nobody cares about agile. They care about business results. And we need to be optimizing everything we do about business results. And often we've got hoodwinked into this thing if we just install this framework if we become agile if we do agile if you be agile whatever then that's the golden ticket and uh, and unfortunately it's not it's about better business and agile might help us get there so i'm hoping that we actually start focusing on real business results and not agile um, removal of silos we've talked about that quite a lot on this call uh, we have to do it it's you cannot achieve agility without removing silos it is just the way it is. So that while we continue to hold on to the sales team, the marketing team, the database team, the finance team, all of these are silos. None of them, we're never going to get it to work unless we let go of this insistence on silo-based uh, organizational design. Um, and then the last thing is a systemic coaching approach. So um, AWA Playbook is uh, freely available. Um, as, you, as I said, I'm, I'm writing my book. There's a chapter in there on the, and it's free. The book's free, so it's not like I'm trying to sell it to you, <laughs> but it's in there. And um, basically the playbook is a systemic coaching approach to organizational change. And what that means is, is that you start with leadership and systemically coach the organization iteratively using experiments towards better business outcomes. Uh, and that's where I think that eventually we'll end up. That's what I'd like to see, more systemic coaching approaches appearing. So that's um, the, oh, and that's, there's the playbook, actually. I've forgotten I put it in there. Um, so this is the playbook. Um, and I'm not going to take you through that now because we've been, I've been talking for ages and it's time for me to stop talking. Uh, are there any, um, any questions or um, any comments or anything else that we'd like to uh, uh, discuss on some of these other points or any of the points before around what a possible future might be. And I'll just turn off this screen share so that we can all see each other again. I guess, Simon, for me, like a lot of what we've talked about in like this today has been about leadership and, and, and you know, leadership really driving the change. But how, how do we truly get our leadership invested in wanting to change rather than carrying on the same behaviours? Um, it's, it's, a, it's a challenging one. Um, I, I found that it's hard to, f you, don't wanna, you can't force anybody to do anything. And at the end of the day, it's their organization. The leaders run the organization. Um, and what I have found is that when we come to leadership with a feeling that we know best, that we're somehow trying to tell them how to run their organization, then that doesn't work. And it creates resistance, animosity, and generally a very short contract or employment uh, uh, prospects. So um, we know that trying to force or coerce or sell doesn't work. So the first thing that I have done is I, I have looked inside myself to really examine what my ego is. What, am, what is my agenda? What am I trying to do here? And if I approach leadership with a sense of deep equality, a, a sense that not that I'm better or that I'm worse than or that I'm lower than, if I come with an equal stance, then there's a good chance that people are going to create a relationship with me. You can't create a relationship with somebody who thinks that they're better than you or you're better than them. It's very hard. It's, it's, it creates a hierarchy, in an inner, inner hierarchy. So we have to come as equals. We have to be able to sit at the same table. And that doesn't mean to say that we're a board member or we get invited in, but we have to at least be able to sit across the table and hold our own and be in a sense of equality. So that opens up the channel for dialogue. Um, the next thing is, is, is to use what I use, a coaching approach, which is to ask questions. How can I be of assistance? How can I help? Is there anything I could do to solve your problems? What are your problems? What's the current state with leadership right now? And asking these kind of questions means that they are doing the talking, not us. 
when we go in with our own agenda we say hey i want to help you look this isn't working or whatever that's an opinion which we're allowing on them we have to let them speak in the space very rarely does any of us in our day have someone who truly listens without an agenda and that's what needs to happen to start with you can't coach someone who doesn't want to be coached if leadership doesn't want to change it's not our job to change it all we can do is be there as an equal asking questions and be ready for the invite for coaching or training and then we can help any kind of pushing is just going to push you right back out the other door i found does that help yeah it definitely does and also um i think you know, one of the things that i've really kind of um, um you kind of come to realize over the last like probably six months or so is that like how much stress really so our leaders are really under like one of my best friends like has, has become like ceo of, of this pretty big like uh in reinsurance company and like you know, the, the, from, from getting that job the stress that he's now under to deliver you know in this environment is immense he, he doesn't sleep Right, yeah, he's under so much stress, and, and, and it's probably not good for him. Uh, th- th- this job, but uh, and, and then you've got like uh, probably so, uh, a group of people, such as myself, in some cases, saying uh, we could be doing this better. Right, yeah, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah and, and, and it probably isn't really what he wants to hear at that moment in time. And there probably is, but, but there's a way of approaching them, like you, yeah, yeah, which is probably not we can do it better, but more like let us help you. We're in it together, you know. Yeah, uh, and, and I think that the you know, words and, and kind of approach is, is really quite key to us. But I guess they've got to be open to it to, to begin with, like you said. And a lot of leaders are desperate to make things better. They just don't know how. And, and the thing is, is that our society and our organisations are so based on action. It's all about what are you going to do? And if you think about decision making, which leads to what we do, decision making comes from what we believe, what our sense of reality is. So if we keep with the same beliefs and the same sense of reality that we make up, we're going to keep making the same decisions. The only way things are going to change is if we shift how we see the world. And that's what the organizations are manifested from is how the leaders see the world. And that's the work that leaders need to do to be able to evolve organisations is to look in and see the world differently. And that's not something which is an action item. That's something which is a reflective item. And so you've got a a bunch of people who have been successful by action, 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 who need to do some reflection so they can do different action, action, action. And it's about creating that space for leaders to be able to do that. And you can you can do that in an action workshop where that action workshop has elements of reflection in it and experiential learning so that people can start to see things a little bit differently so that they can start to rebuild their belief system so that they can then take different types of actions. Um, but like you say, it has to be invited in. You can't force people to turn up to a workshop. Yeah, for sure. I mean, one thing you there's quite a lot of uh, obviously different approaches to sort of like, you know, how we work. And one, I, I often look back at um, like reading like Dan Pint's book, like uh, Drive, and he talks about like the uh, row results only working environment. And, and, and like, it, I'd be quite interested to see sort of like new approaches emerge. To, to how leadership teams work like something like you know, where you know, maybe they work for three months or you know, a period of time on on, on, on something like on part of the strategy or part part of the the vision and 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 uh, then roll off like we, and, and have some time to like you know, to reflect and learn you know, you know, and, and to kind of feed feed things that they've learned like as a result of that piece of work back into the system you know but you know, I, I don't see so as much kind of like uh you know, kind of manage like leadership kind of like you know, teams apologies and, and kind of patterns as i obviously do with like you know, like team organization and, and maybe there's there's a gap in the market for that uh, you might try having a look at there's a few culture books and things like everyone culture and things like that which are quite good in terms of a few techniques about creating good cultures uh, and there's also some fantastic book um, called Action Logics, I think it's called, or Action, yeah, I think it's Action Logics, 
uh, or Action Inquiry, um, which is a fantastic book about uh, personal development, human development, and different things that happen at different stages of our development from childhood all the way to a sort of transformational leader. And there's some fantastic things in there as well. Action Inquiry, I think the book's called, wow, and the, yeah. the model is called Action Logics. Oh, um, so that's, that's, that's a, a good read. Um, and uh, in there, there's there's various different things around uh, different techniques that different leaders at different stages, and there's different assessments you can do on yourself to see kind of where, where you fit. And then there's different exercises and things that you can try to sort of grow yourself as a leader uh, in, into, in, into working in that way. Uh, and the big shift for me, like I said, it's from the I into the we, and that's creating a space uh, so that the, the amount of leadership, the amount of people that you're able to uh, lead in an agile way is really based about how big a space can you hold in terms of your culture and the way that you behave and what the en energy space that you can hold in the company. Uh, and that takes a lot of practice to sort of grow that out. So if you think about if you're in a room with five people, if if there's people, if, there, if just before you walked in, two people were shouting at each other and then you enter the room having no knowledge of what's happened without anybody saying you can tell there's a tension in the room you can feel it and it's like if you imagine that on an organizational wide level what's your organization feel like is it a calm organization is it a frenetic organization what does that feel like how big can a leader feel their organizational space and create the culture necessary to enable that organization to be in the right space to deliver work. And that's a lot of inner work and a lot of, uh, a lot of ability of sensing and sense making and the right facilitation and coaching techniques to enable an organization to grow its culture. And I see that's how leadership needs to develop in the, along those lines. Yeah, it is psychology really, isn't it, at the end of the day? It's a lot of things, yeah, psychology being one of them, definitely. Cool. Has anyone got any questions or anything they would like to ask? Because I do appreciate it. we've been on this call for quite some time. And um, if there's uh, anything that anyone wants to ask, um, then now's the time because we'll probably be wrapping up fairly soon. We've been speaking about the, uh, the, the topic that was on my mind too. So Barry beat me to it, to be fair. Um, how do we get leaders to uh, understand the value of Agile? Um, it's, a, it's a big, big challenge because, you know, as I said, um, my company um, laid off some agile coaches and instead they hired more software developers because they think that's, that's, that's what they need to do to, to deliver more. And, and it just clearly, clearly shows that they don't understand agile. Um, they're just going to hire more workers and uh, work more inefficiently. Yeah. As, um, as I think Craig Longman says, I've got, this is also, I keep mentioning my book. I'm not trying to plug it, honestly. It's just that I've literally finished the chapter today, so it's in my head. But literally on the top of that chapter, there's a quote from Craig Longman that says, um, uh, in fact, I've got it open here. I'll, just, I'll, I'll read out the quote to you. It says, um, uh, where is it? He says, uh, He says, the reasons why people believe that they need large numbers of bodies as though this was a digging a ditch problem are based upon flawed understanding of the nature of software development and people as nonlinear systems. And, um, and, and that's a Craig Larman quote. So it, it, it's, it, it's the same thing for, for, as what we've been saying, really. It's a real lack of understanding of the three mindset beliefs, a lack of understanding of complexity. We have a lack of understanding about how people work and operate and a cult, how to build a culture and a lack of understanding about how to continuously improve and reflect and grow. And, and these three beliefs are not held by 95% of leadership, which is the, what comes from the leadership circles. Um, so something like about 100,000 leadership circle 360s that people have done across, you know, all over the world. What they have said is that only 5% of people have the necessary inner operating system if you like to deal with the level of complexity that agility is for so only five percent of leaders are actually able to lead in agility because they don't have these beliefs so there's a lot of growing that's needed for us to be able to grow as a as a, as a human race you know anyway sorry it's been a bit doom and gloom <laughs> it feels like we've just been talking about bad stuff but there is a there is a there is a way forwards and, uh, and it starts with ourselves, really, and uh, showing up as equals, learning about ourselves, learning how to grow and, uh, and helping wherever there's an invite, taking that up and helping others to grow as much as they can around those beliefs. I think. 
it's kind of kind of interesting because uh, I, I I reflect back to uh, my the first CCon where I had Joe Maleski do a talk um, about organisations and uh, it's interesting how we uh, still uh, you know, I, I feel that large enterprises are very much controlled by the accountants you know, and, and profit centres that you. Know, it, Profit loss balance sheets and moving things from, from 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 one to the other without really offering a lot of value you, you, to customers and I think we've moved away from that a bit but like you but uh, you, I still don't think we're there on like the throughput accounting you really thinking about like delivering value rather than rather than cutting costs and uh, you know that was five years ago so uh, you know, it's it's you know, it's interesting what what a lot of people have said on on, on the mural board about like you know, uh, you know doing things by the book you know, almost like being back to square one but knowing almost what to do but now but like how to do it is I think you know, where, what, what we've got to focus on. Uh, it's interesting you bring up the finance because we do live in a capitalist world where um, the whole capitalist infrastructure is built upon growth. So um, there is an underlying expectation that the stock market always goes up over time. And, um, and, and many, many of our investment vehicles, including our pensions, um, the way that GDP and, and inflation works, is all based around uh, this underlying belief that everything grows. Uh, and the way things grow is that we have to keep working and we have to keep taking things out of the ground and we have to keep making stuff with it and we have to keep the whole thing going. And, um, and then when you look at uh, that from a financial perspective inside an organisation and the pressures that are, are created by continual growth, and then, um, and then you look at that from an agile perspective and how software development teams are working and we want to be able to change direction and we want to pull down money when we need it because we've learned some more stuff. And uh, there's a there's a translator there in the middle, which has someone has to has to start with at least a lot of faith that actually money is created by value, not by control. And this only is true when we reach a certain level of complexity of technology and people and uh, customer needs. Um, so in the early days, in less complexity, you could create money through control. Crack that handle faster, turn that hast faster, you know, make people work harder. You know, that awful past, right, that we've had was about control. And we're ever moving away from these days of control, moving towards more sense of freedom. But with that freedom, come, I was going to say, comes responsibility. That says like my dad. But basically, with uh, with with freedom comes that um, trust in the, in the, it, you have to be able to create that value and, and by focusing on that quality and value is where you get the money and, uh, and, and, and that's that's the belief in complexity in people and if you don't have that you resort back to control and that's the shift that I think that has to happen uh, and we can still make it work in a capitalist society but we have to believe that value creates money not control. One question Simon. Uh, have you been reading and uh, following the teal organizations where there's a lot of uh, trust uh, induced in the team and then the team takes care of itself and then uh, value is produced as a byproduct, you can say? Yes, thank you. Um, so, yes, so teal organizations embody this kind of sense of self-realization so that people are able to turn up with one of the earmarks of a teal organization. So just for those people who, who may have not heard of this, it's basically a color coding scheme which was created by uh, to denote certain types of uh, organizational culture. And teal is the sort of like the, the it's not the late, it's not the most advanced, but it's the most advanced that anyone's likely to see on planet Earth right now. Um, and it was popularized by Reinventing Organizations, a book by Frederick Merleau. Uh, and so Teal is, um, which is a fantastic book, if you haven't read that, for, um, Reinventing Organizations. Um, and uh, Teal Organizations, uh, the hallmark of a Teal Organization is that you show up with your whole self, so that you bring your whole self to work. And uh, of course, many of us can't do that. Many of us have to leave half of ourselves behind. There's things we can't talk about. We can't show up. You're not allowed to have emotions. You know, in many cases, we have a professional mask, you know, and uh, and, and it's that. Um, and, and, and like we were saying, only 5% of leaders, according to the stats, are able to comprehend the level of complexity and people belief that is required. So you can't bring your whole self to work in a very deep hierarchical control organization. So Teal, again, is very rare. 
because you've only got 5% of all leaders and probably only a few of those work in an organisation where they actually have some level of control or, or, or not even control, but some level of influence over the structure. So yes, tiered organisation is fantastic, but we've got to start with leadership because organisational structure emerges from the mindset of those creating it. Just thank you, everyone, everyone, for coming, and thanks a lot, so much for Simon for sharing his thoughts. And you, uh, uh, you as I said, he's been here from the start. Uh, if you haven't looked at uh, Adventures with Agile uh, and what they offer, please have a look at their website. They've got some amazing courses uh, coming up, including one of my own. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, take take a look at that. Uh, thanks for coming, and hopefully uh, we we'll see you again in April. Mm-hmm.